Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Tanya Winters, the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third in our virtual conference series, Black People Like Me. Today, our title is COVID-19 and Black Folk, Changing the Game, Changing the Outcome. Again, this is a program and a series of programs that is supported through a Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute uh, grant, educational grant, that we are very excited to bring to you. And the title today, the program today, was designed by our group of Black advisors who we have convened to determine what are the greatest needs of the community and how do we bring forth information, education, to address those needs and to advance patient-centered outcomes research in the African-American community. Today, I'm joined by a, a very illustrious panel of presenters, Dr. Leroy Graham, Dr. Pervy Parikh, Dr. Monica Webb-Hooper, and Sandra Finley. And so our time together, we will go over just kind of the current state of COVID-19, and Dr. Graham will lead that session. And then Dr. Pervy Parikh will join us in providing a vaccine update. Dr. Parikh has been on the front lines in New York City and has also been an investigator in many of the vaccine trials. And so she can provide her insight of any clinical-based practice as well as the research and vaccination uh, investigations. And then we're going to turn to some of the questions that you want answered. And we're going to hear from Dr. Monica Webb Hooper uh, with the NIH that we are very honored to have with us today. We'll conclude our time by answering your Q&A. And so we do have the ability for you at any time to enter your questions into the panel. We'll get to as many of those as possible during our time together. We also ask that you keep your line on mute if you are not actively speaking. This will ensure that we have no background noise and we will be recording today's session. Uh, today's session will be made available at the blackpeoplelikeme.org website within 48 hours of our presentation. Now today we have three primary objectives. We'll first start yeah. by covering how black patients, families, and caregivers are adversely impacted by COVID-19 and why that's happening. Then we'll take a look at some of the challenges of the COVID-19 vaccines and how we can continue to foster trust in the vaccine within the Black community. And then finally, we'll address some of the questions that Black people want answered about COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccines. So again, uh, thank you all for joining me and I'd like to formally introduce our panel. Panelists, if you could please add your video, that would be wonderful. Okay, so it's my honor first to introduce Dr. Pervy Parikh. Dr. Parikh is a clinical assistant professor of medicine at New York University School of Medicine and a COVID-19 vaccine clinical trial investigator. Dr. Parikh is the national spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network and is frequently seen on all of the major news networks, uh, being the patient voice and the expert voice in allergy, asthma, and COVID. Second, we have Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Dr. Hooper is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. And we are so honored to hear from her today. And then finally, we have our patient advocate, Sandra Finley. She is a patient advisory group member and has helped us to organize the Black People Like Me sessions and programs. And uh, she is also a COVID survivor. So she'll be sharing her own personal experience uh, and her husband's experience of surviving COVID. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Graham and ask him to take us away on the current state of COVID-19. Well, good afternoon. It's indeed my honor and my pleasure to speak to you about uh, COVID-19 and how it's impacting black people. Next slide. Okay, you, most of you are probably very familiar with the John Hopkins uh, website. If you're not, it's very, very easy to get to. It's very easy to look at. 
Uh, one of the things we note, unfortunately, is the United States is leading in cases and leading in mortality. Um, there are many reasons for this, but we clearly have not turned the corner. There are promising signs to be seen for sure, but there are many, many things that we have to still do and we have to stay focused. And that's an essential part because I think there's a lot of COVID fatigue out there. And I can't stress enough that getting the vaccine and uh, masking and, and just generally looking out for each other is so very critical at this time. Uh, we do see some promise in some of the numbers going down. We see the states in dark that have the highest uh, cases per 100,000 over the last seven days. And it's very interesting, this is my opinion, I'm not a statistician, that this changes fairly dramatically from time to time. And I think it reflects behaviors as well as advances that are or not being made in terms of what the public does. So I guess that message there is that it's so very, very important for us to be individuals who are part of a collective and wearing a mask and social distancing is not a punishment, but it's a show that you care about those around you. And we are now we're near the percentage of vaccinations as you will hear where we can forego that. So one of the things that's, that's kind of bogged us down is these racial disparities. And, and we as black people, um, I think we've seen this story before but this time it has a very lethal outcome and a very morbid outcome. Uh, we see that black and brown people to be very specific and our Native American brothers and sisters clearly are beset with disparities in contradistinction to our white friends and colleagues. The reasons for these are many and they go to the social determinants of health, but we can't stand and just shake our fist at this. We have to realize that we as a population for a variety of reasons are exceedingly vulnerable and we must take action among ourselves, getting the vaccine, doing the measures that I previously discussed. One of the things that we have to realize and I as an African-American, despite being a doctor, I totally understand this, is history's given us a high level of distrust in our government. We know that there have been atrocities uh, such as the Tuskegee experiment, the use of uh, bar barbaric surgery in African-American women to advance gynecologic procedures. We know that uh, even today, and it's not clear why, sometimes the resources in terms of vaccinations and the resources in different aspects of this don't seem to get into our communities. Uh, this has left us as a most hesitant group to get the vaccine once available. And the tragedy of that is that that hesitancy is harming us. We are skeptic, we are skeptics. We have good reason for being skeptic, but we have to understand that because of our living situations, because of a number of things that impact this, we as African-Americans or Blacks are two and a half times more likely to contract COVID-19. And tragically, we're five times more likely to die. So th those of you that are hearing this, I want you to see if you can move beyond those concerns and, and move into being an active and a, a point of one that you can make a difference. So we need to have some questions answered, okay? We need to know about how many people like me are in these clinical trials. Do they really reflect me? Will the vaccine really keep me from getting COVID-19? And the answer to that is, is probably yes. Uh, basically, we know that these vaccines have high degrees of efficacy. The investigators have gone to great lengths to make sure that the sample population study reflects our uh, diversity in our country. Uh, many people say, well, if I got the vaccine, why do I still need to wear a mask? Well, there's no 100% guarantee. And actually wearing a mask is a sign of caring for those around us, okay? And when you're in different environments, whether it's going to the grocery store, getting on an airplane, whatever, you're not sure about the people around you. They're not sure about you. So wearing a mask is not a punishment, but it's a proactive statement showing that you care. Uh, if I get COVID-19 between the shot and the scheduled second shot, what do I do? Well, you contact your, your physician, but the reality is that you will probably go ahead and get that vaccine. I'm happy to tell you that I sit here now about 24 hours after getting my second uh, dose of Moderna. And I consider myself incredibly blessed. And I'll let you know the achiness went away about 10 o'clock this morning. So those are some of the reactions that people get. And here's the interesting thing. Those symptoms that I got, and, and they were a little irritating because I, I wanted to get on my Peloton first thing in the morning and that wasn't happening because I was hurting. But that's a sign that my body is responding. It's producing antibodies. It's developing an inflammatory response, which will help me 
not get COVID-19. So in terms of you're pregnant or nursing, should you get the vaccine? Those are issues that I think I've read several points on that, but I think you should talk to your obstetrician or gynecologist in that, respect, in that respect. But the point is you should be having an ongoing dialogue with whoever your primary care is at this time. Um, I've heard answers to say that you probably should. But again, I encourage you to embrace that all important patient uh, physician relationship and that sense of trust with someone that provides you care who you do trust. Great, so thank you so much, Dr. Graham. I'm gonna to go to our very first poll question and this is our audience participation time. And so you all will have the opportunity here as I launch the poll to share your own experience. Have you gotten COVID-19, your COVID-19 vaccine yet? Yes, no, but I plan to, or no, I don't plan on getting the vaccine at this time. So we'll give everyone a few moments. We do have over a thousand people that have registered for today's event. And uh, we're very excited to have you all with us, but we wanna hear from you. What is your experience around the vaccine, your thoughts around the vaccine? So thank you for participating in the poll. We'll give it just a moment and then we'll close it and share the results so everyone can see. All right, looks like we've got about 80% of people who have responded. So we'll share the results. You should be able to see those now. And so in this group, 45% have received the vaccine. I can't tell you how exciting that is to me to see and hear that so many of you have already been proactive in seeking out the vaccine. And then another 35% who say you haven't gotten it yet, but you do plan to. And then 20% who still aren't quite sure if they plan on getting the vaccine or not particularly at this time. Thank you all for sharing. It's really important. At Allergy and Asthma Network, we definitely support individual choice, but we want you to be informed in that individual choice. And we think that these types of conferences and discussions are vital to that. So now let's go to our second polling question. And I'll have to just launch it here for you. If you don't plan on getting the vaccine, what is your reason why? Is it concerns over safety? you just simply don't get vaccines, or you really don't wanna be a guinea pig, so you're gonna wait and see. And again, no judgment zone here. We understand that everybody has their own reasons and motives behind this, uh, but we just wanna get a good idea from each of you what your current thought is. If you don't plan on getting the vaccine, what your reason is. So again, we'll give it just another few moments and then we'll share the results. Looks like pretty much everyone who shared it before uh, that they were not planning to get the vaccine or have not yet is, is logging in their response now. So I'll end the poll and share the results. So about 36% of you say your concern is safety. And then 8% just say, I really don't typically take vaccines. And then 55% who have that concern about wanting just to wait and not wanting to be the first out of the gate. Thank you again for sharing. Okay, now we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Parikh and she's going to provide us with the vaccine overview. Dr. Parikh. Hello, thank you. Um, all right. We, can everybody see me and hear me? Yes, okay. we can, you're great, thanks. Okay, good, um, one second, all right. So the vaccine, you know, this has been kind of the light at the end of a very long and dark tunnel. Um, today, up to date, total doses that have been delivered are close to uh, 59 million. Um, and then the total doses that have been administered to date are about 41 million. Um, and then number of people that have received one dose is 31 million. And the number of people that have received two is close to 10 million. And this is huge because we've finally exceeded the amount of people that have been vaccinated um, in relation to people who have been infected with COVID-19. And I, I hope that trend continues that as we vaccinate more, the numbers of infected will drop as well. So, you know, are vaccines effective? And the simple answer is yes, you know, vaccines save lives. 
Um, scientists, you know, widely consider immunization to be one of the greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. And it's true, you know, in certain places we've eradicated diseases that were um, killing people, you know, 30, 50, 100 years ago. Um, flu vaccination reduces the risk of flu illness by between 40 to 60% in the overall population. Um, and two doses of inactivated polio vaccines are 90% or more effective uh, against polio, you know, and three are 99% effective. And, you know, we are seeing less and less a lot of the long-term complications um, from polio, such as paralysis. Uh, and I know people personally who didn't have that privilege of receiving the polio vaccine and to this day uh, don't have function of their leg. So uh, it's not a small matter. You know, these vaccines um, save people, not just from the infection, but many of the complications that are permanent that come from these infections and communicable diseases. So, you know, just to uh, get an overview of what's been going on um, with the coronavirus vaccine tra tracker, you know, it's been an unprecedented time. This is the first time in, you know, nearly a hundred years where the entire global scientific community has been working together towards one goal. And because of that, we've been able to, um, you know, achieve the success of having multiple life-saving vaccines in a short amount of time. And this doesn't mean that they're rushed or not safe, but it just shows what humanity is capable of when they work together. So currently, um, you know, there are four approved globally for use, two in the US. Um, and, you know, there are about six that are currently um, in limited use and uh, 20 that are still in trial. So it's always good news to have multiple options, especially as we see variants. And, you know, just like any medication, there may be one vaccine that's more beneficial to one group versus another. So the types of COVID-19 vaccines, it's important to understand them. Um, so the two that currently have emergency use approval in the US are both mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines. And the way that they work is basically, um, it's almost like a recipe or uh, I, I love that the ex director of the CDC called it a Snapchat message. I'm, I'm not on Snapchat, but I, I like the concept behind it. Basically it's synthetically produced RNA fragments of the virus that are used to give the body instructions. Uh, and this teaches the body uh, how to build the protein that mimics the virus, that spike protein. Uh, and, and the beauty of it is that the immune system recognizes this and mounts immunity without you actually having to get sick with the virus at all. So there's no live virus, there's no dead virus in it. Um, and dissimilar to a recipe or Snapchat message, the instructions are there and then they're gone, you know, and then your own immune system kicks in and hopefully builds that lasting immunity. Now, the other types of vaccines, the vector vaccines, um, you know, two of which, which are in clinical trial, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, and hopefully, you know, one or both will be approved for emergency use soon. Uh, this is a little bit different technology. And basically what it does is it uses an inactivated common cold virus, uh, either from a chimpanzee or a human, and that virus acts almost as a uh, vehicle to carry in the genetic information about um, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And then that's how your immune system is then introduced to it and then builds that immunity that hopefully will last. So that one also doesn't have any live or dead uh, COVID-19 in it. So you can't get sick from either of these two viruses and there's no actual virus in either of these um, technologies. So, um, you know, vaccine overview, Moderna was one of the first uh, to announce their mRNA formulation. Um, it has now been approved since mid-December for emergency use. There's two doses that are given about four weeks apart. Um, it's 94.5% effective, which is huge. You know, um, just to give you perspective, the flu vaccine, which we were just talking about, is only about 40 to 50% effective uh, on a yearly basis. And it still saves lives and it still stops hospitalizations. Um, and this Moderna may be slightly more effective in younger groups than in elderly, but we're still, um, you know, gathering information and get, gathering data. Uh, and then, you know, side effects, this one tend to be, tended to be more what we call immunogenic or reactogenic. So uh, people had, you know, pain in the injection site, some flu-like symptoms, but all of these were expected and subsided quickly. Uh, and this one, you know, can be stored at negative 20 degrees for up to six months. So sometimes it's easier to use 
uh, for non-hospital settings, because some of the other vaccines need to be kept very, very cold. Um, and the FDA has great information about this vaccine on their fact sheet and all of the vaccines um, for that matter. Uh, Pfizer, um, which was one of the first, also an mRNA vaccine, just like Moderna, was one of the first to clear approval um, about a week before Moderna. So it was nice. We had two weeks of back-to-back -back good news after their FDA hearings. Um, and this one is already being used on a massive scale just because it was approved first. Um, again, mRNA vaccine. This is also two doses. This one has to be about three weeks apart instead of four. That's how it was studied um, and also 95% effective. So it's nice that both of the mRNA vaccines have very similar efficacy, you know, because that gives us an idea that when you're able to repeat something or reproduce something in medicine, that's a good sign that that, you know, data is strong. That's what we like to see. Uh, and this one gives good protection to older people as well. Doesn't mean that the Moderna doesn't. We just need more information as the, the group that was studied was uh, small in numbers. Um, these side effects are very similar to the Moderna one. Again, pain at the injection site, uh, flu-like symptoms, um, most subside in a day to two. Sometimes you can have fever, muscle aches, fatigue. Um, but this one, you know, has to be shipped and temporarily stored at negative 70 degrees. So it's much harder to roll out in, you know, physicians' offices or pharmacies and places that don't have those sub-zero freezers. So often, these, many of these are administered uh, in the, at hospitals and other facilities that can store it. Um, and at normal uh, refrigerator temperatures, it has a shelf life of about five days. Um, and just on a personal note, this was the vaccine that I had received, but um, I was willing to take either one, whichever I could get into my arm fastest. Um, the rest of my close family members received Moderna, and we were all happy about that as well. Um, and then next, you know, is the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, this one is that different technology that I had mentioned, um, the adenovirus vector technology, where we use that inactivated common cold virus to help bring that information to your immune system to teach it how to mount that immunity. So um, the, some of the benefits of this is that it can pr be produced in large quantities. Uh, luckily, it doesn't require special cooling. It, uh, you know, you can keep it in a regular refrigerator. And the efficacy on this, we're still waiting for more information to come out from the company because initially, um, you know, with two doses of the same uh, strength, the efficacy was about 60 to 70 percent. But the company is saying that when they do uh, half a dose of, you know, half of the strength followed by the full dose, that it can reach 90 percent efficacy. So it will be exciting to see uh, the results from those um, studies once they wrap up. This is also a two dose vaccine one month apart. Um, again, the side effects were very, very similar to Pfizer and Moderna, the flu-like symptoms, injection site pain, um, fatigue, et cetera. And again, none were severe, none were permanent, all resolved uh, quite quickly. And this one's already approved in the UK and they're actually administering it with a booster at three months. So um, I'll just briefly touch on this because this one is not in the US, but uh, you know, this is an, also a vector vaccine. It's being used in Russia. Um, often requires uh, multiple doses, and it's, uh, you know, named Sputnik V. <laughs> um, I, I like the name, but, you know, so this vaccine also is very similar in technology to AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, just so you're aware of what's going on uh, around the world. Um, and then Sinopharm, or in China, um, they're, this is a different, again, technology where they're um, using um, a vaccine that is inactivated COVID-19 vaccine. And it's a classic, your classic method of triggering an immune reaction by using an inactive virus. So our, you know, the flu vaccine we use every year is an inactivated flu virus. Uh, many of the other vaccines that we use. So this one showed about 79% efficacy in trials, but it's just interesting to see what everybody is doing all over the world. Johnson and Johnson, I'm sure if, you know if any of you have been in front of the TV recently. You've been hearing a lot of buzz about this vaccine. Um, again, not yet approved, but they actually have a date set for the FDA to uh, review it, and that will be on February 26th. Um, this one again is that viral vector vaccine. Um, you know the studies have been ranging on on its efficacy. So initially, 
Uh, there was thoughts that it was, you know, 97% of the study participants developed antibodies, which is great news, but the actual overall efficacy is around 62%. Uh, but again, that's not any reason to panic or to worry because this vaccine still uh, prevented death 100%, so there were zero deaths, and it uh, prevented severe COVID-19, you know, the hospitalizations, ICU stays, by close to 89%. So that's huge, you know, because we're not looking for a cure, but we really want to make sure that those severe outcomes of COVID-19 are reduced. Um, and the other great benefit of that vaccine is just one dose. So that will really help with the vaccine rollout once it is approved. And that also can be stored in a normal refrigerator. So um, I like this slide because it kind of explains everything I just went through, um, the type of vaccine, the dosages, um, and you know how soon you can start seeing antibodies or you know um, signs of immunity after the vaccine. And as you can see, the efficacy is kind of uh, listed too across the board. But again, and I can't say this enough, you can't compare them saying one is more effective than the other because it's like apples and oranges. And until a study is done, with all of them in a head-to-head -head basis, that will be the only way we can truly compare them. But the important thing to note is you should get what is offered to you because they all prevent death and they all will um, prevent your chances of ending up in the hospital uh, with all of the terrible complications. Um, and again, this is just another slide. I'm not gonna read through all of it, but again, it gives us an idea of um, storage requirements, um, You know how long it lasts in your body, the half-life, and the key thing is that a lot of, um, you know, these vaccines, there's a lot of concern about, you know, how long, if there will be any long-term side effects, things like that. But majority of them, uh, you know, they're, they're not in your body for that long. The half-life is quite short. They get excreted quickly. And the chances of long-term side effects are minimal from what we know right now. So again, you know, the vaccine rollout has been challenging, just to, to say the least. Um, and, you know, the, the goal is that, you know, we want to make sure everyone with severe morbi morbidity and mortality um, and have a negative, uh, you know, don't have a negative impact. We want to make sure those people get vaccinated quickly. So the allocation criteria so far, those priority groups have been based on the risk of acquiring infection. Um, severe morbidity and mortality, that means those groups that are high risk uh, for COVID-19 or severe COVID-19, meaning um, death, uh, ICU admissions, et cetera. Um, and then anyone who may have a negative social impact um, or you know, the, the chances of transmitting the infection to others. So there's four phases currently for the allocation that have been delineated. Um, phase one, which many of us, uh, many states in the U.S. are in right now, so that includes, you know, those uh, high-risk professions and groups, so uh, essential workers, frontline workers, um, hospital, uh, healthcare employees, um, people of a certain age group, people with certain comorbidities, and then phase two further delineates by profession as well. So some states that have been doing a great job with the rollout are already into phase two, which is great. Um, so that's, you know, that includes teachers, ch uh, childcare workers, um, people of all ages that have uh, comorbidities. So I know New York, for example, will be entering into that phase next week. Um, you know, people in homeless shelters, group homes, because as we know, some people aren't able to distance, like so even, Social distancing in itself is a privilege, depending where you live and your circumstances. Um, you know, people in prisons, other high-risk communities where that uh, distancing is difficult. Uh, then after that, hopefully young adults and children, and I'm hoping that we can even get children uh, starting to get vaccinated or even um, get them vaccinated before the next school year. We'll see. Um, there are pediatric trials that are underway right now. Uh, and then phase four is kind of everybody, you know, just like how it is for the flu vaccine, you know, where we're just encouraging everyone from public standpoint to go out and receive the vaccine. So again, this has been a landmark in the pandemic response for Americans, because before this, we really had no real defense against this virus. Um, and the nice thing is it appears to be equally protective across age groups, um, appears to be equally protective across racial and ethnic groups, because as we're discussing today, certain racial and ethnic groups are hit at almost three times higher of a rate of contracting the virus, the complications and deaths from the virus. 
Um, and luckily, severe systemic events were, are very, very rare, you know, less than 2% out of the millions that have been vaccinated to date. Um, the allergic reactions I know comes up a lot. You know, I'm an allergist, so this is something I get asked about pretty much on a daily basis. So there's been 104 cases of allergic reactions uh, and about 21 cases of anaphylaxis after administration of the first uh, close to 2 million doses. And I just want to note that even though it seems like these reactions are very, very common, we actually went further and the CDC just recently released information that even out of all of these cases that I just spoke of, only 10% truly meet the, meet the criteria for an allergic reaction or anaphylactic reaction. So it's still exceedingly very rare. In general, allergic reactions and anaphylaxis to vaccines are very rare. Um, you're statistically more likely to be hit by lightning than to have a reaction. And there's many things that mimic allergic reactions, but may not actually be true allergies. And again, those things are not um, life-threatening. They're not concerning. Um, they might feel uncomfortable, but they're not dangerous and you can proceed to your next dose. So if you're not sure, or if you did have any issue with the first dose, don't forego your second dose without speaking to a board certified allergist because we can help navigate if uh, you can proceed with the second dose or not. Um, so usually for allergic symptoms, they happen very quickly. So that's why we encourage people to wait for 20 to 30 minutes uh, after they have the vaccine at the facility. Um, and many even occur in the first 15 minutes, you know? So common things are rash, itching, uh, scratchy throat, you may have respiratory symptoms. And again, it all happens quickly. So if something happens a week later, likely it's not an allergy. Even two or three days later, uh, it's also unlikely to be related to the vaccine from an allergy standpoint. Um, again, the, these vaccines have very strong safety profiles. Even in the actual studies, we included people with all sorts of allergies. So severe food allergies, drug allergies, asthma. We only excluded those who had known uh, reactions to vaccines in the past, uh, or anyone who might have an uh, allergy to one of the ingredients in the vaccine. And that's still the only contraindication that exists today. So if you're allergic to one of the ingredients in the vaccine, um, then yes, of course you should forego it. But otherwise it's very safe, even in very allergic patients. Um, and what we think might be the culprit is a, a chemical called polyethylene glycol. But it's very common, it's in so many different um, things. So it's in toothpaste, it's in Miralax, which is a very commonly used stool softener. So chances are you probably, if you don't know of this allergy, you probably are not allergic because so, we're exposed to it on a daily basis. Um, and the good news is usually allergic reactions come from inactive ingredients, not the active ingredients. So for example, in other vaccines, not in this one, um, people may react to egg protein, gelatin, formaldehyde, dimerosol, neomycin, none of these components are in the COVID-19 vaccine. And again, the one that we're concerned about here is polyethylene glycol um, and possibly polysorbate. But again, even polysorbate is in a lot of other vaccines, including the flu shot. So if we've tolerated the flu shot before, uh, likely you'll be um, okay. And then again, there's no food, drugs, or latex, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and we kind of will screen people, you know, if you've had a serious, uh, severe allergic to, uh, reaction to an injectable medicine or a vaccine. Um, we also will screen to see if you're allergic to another allergen. But again, this does not preclude you from receiving the vaccine. This also does not mean that you will have any problems with the vaccine. This gives us an idea of your overall um, medical history. And the key question is about that polyethylene glycol. So if you know you're allergic to that, uh, obviously do not participate, I mean, do not proceed with the vaccine. Um, and the same goes with polysorbate, just clear it with your doctor first. Um, so again, uh, this is kind of just reiterating the same thing. If, if you know you have problems with that ingredient, uh, be careful, you know, so, but you may, even if you're allergic to other vaccines, you may be able to get this because ingredients are different um, from vaccine to vaccine. So if you have a reaction, I do ask again, and this is a CDC recommendation that you do see a board certified allergist so that uh, they, we can determine if you can proceed with the second dose, because I've been hearing a lot of stories that people are skipping that second dose uh, when they don't necessarily need to, because it's not a clear allergic reaction. Um, and eventually we may have allergy testing. Currently, we don't have good validated testing yet 
but that will be another tool that the allergist can use to hopefully determine if it's safe or not. But as I said, most cases, people are able to get both the doses without any problems. Um, so then we'll move yes. on. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. Thank you, Dr. Breek. Yes, wonderful job. Thank you so much for going over that. It was so much uh, information about the vaccines, but so vitally important. We appreciate your expertise and knowledge and sharing it with us this afternoon. So we're going to go to another polling question. Do you personally know anyone who has gotten COVID-19? Yes, no, or I have had COVID-19. So we'll go ahead and launch the poll and you can uh, put your response in. We'll leave it open for just a moment and see how uh, our group of, of, again, close to a thousand people that were registered for this afternoon's uh, session report. Okay, just one more second and then I will share those results. So do you personally know anyone who has gotten COVID-19 and as we share that, what you'll see is that 18% of you say, yes, you've had COVID. 81% uh, of you know someone other than yourself who have had COVID. And then only 5% of those on the line today don't know anyone directly that's been impacted by COVID. I think this speaks to the importance of our time together today and of this common uh, experience that we're all going through with COVID-19. It really is, is quite remarkable. So now we're gonna go actually to our next polling question. And that is, do you personally know anyone who has died from COVID-19? Yes or no? If you could log in your response now will share. We unfortunately at Allergy and Asthma Network, we get these reports almost on a daily basis from families that uh, have lost a loved one or are in the ICU and, and definitely struggling. Um, or And then many, thankfully, that are recovering, but still have a very long road ahead of them on that recovery due to uh, ventilation and complications of COVID. So let's see in our group today what the response is. So over half, 59% of you on the line know someone personally who has died from COVID-19 and 41% have not. Uh, again, I'll just say thank you for sharing your experience. We are so sorry for your loss, uh, your family's loss, your friends that you've lost. Uh, this is the common thread that brings us all together. And it's also why I'm honored now to invite Sandra Finley to share a bit more about her experience and her husband's experience as COVID survivors. Sandra? All right. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, we, we can hear you and you're all set. Okay. You can hear me. I, I can't yes. see you seeing me, but you see the slide, I guess. <laughs> yes. All right. I am uh, Sandra Finley and I'm happier than you can possibly know to be able to be with you here today because my husband and I did have COVID and it tried to kill us um, and almost did. Let me take you with me to, to a memory of what happened and uh, just ask you to just kind of follow with me in your own minds as, as I kind of lay this, this experience out for you. Eddie got sick in March, well, maybe late February, and we thought it was the flu. And we worked with it and did all the things you could do about that for a whole week and he didn't get better. So I took him to urgent care and the urgent care uh, uh, nurse uh, looked and examined him and said it looked like a pretty bad flu to him, but he wasn't sure, but he gave him a prescription for flu, you know, for the symptoms that you could have and then said that we should feel a little bit better. A month, not a month, I'm sorry, a week later, and he was still sick and not doing any better. I took him back uh, desperately to urgent care and the... Uh, the care uh, professional there said, well, we've heard about this uh, other thing that might be, tell you what, let me give you this test. And so he stuck this stip up Eddie's nose and talked a little bit about what that was about. And then when he explained it, I said, well, uh, probably I got it too. So stick the stick up my nose. And he did. 
but he still was not able to get any results on that day. And so we went home and we wrestled with what we thought was Eddie's flu for yet another week. When Eddie's got even worse, um, I, I talked to the urgent care person uh, and he said, well, take him on up to the emergency room because I want him to have a test there that we can't give here. But when we got to the emergency room, Eddie is so sick. They know exactly at the hospital what they're looking at. And they took him immediately onto the other side of the desk, told me to go sit in my car and wait. And they would tell me then what uh, the situation would be. I'm sitting in my car in the cold in the parking lot. This is in the spring and March now. And my son is calling and asking what's going on. And when I told him, he said, mom, you can't sit in the dark in the cold parking lot, go home. If they are gonna keep dad, they'll let you know. And if they're not, then we'll come and get him. But you can't sit in the cold parking lot. And I, just the isolation and the terror. Uh, I, I did just what my son said, I went home, found out that they were keeping my husband and that he had been diagnosed with COVID. We, that was the first time we really knew its name. Oh, whoa. So we, um, Eddie struggles at the hospital to try to get over COVID uh, for just about a week. And in that week, while he's in the hospital, then I get uh, symptoms and I get sick. And I'm thinking it might be the same thing. I go back to the hospital emergency room now, and they've got tents and things set up in the parking lot. And I have them check me over and they tell me that I do have a temperature, but I'm not really sick enough. Therefore I should go home. And if I cannot make my temperature go down with Tylenol, and if I have trouble breathing, then I should come back. And I do what they told me to do. And then I did get really low sick and I couldn't make my temperature go down with anything that I knew how to do. And I wasn't sure folks how to determine whether I was having trouble with breathing because I was having trouble with breathing, but not knowing how much trouble means trouble. I, I didn't know what to do. So I made my own rule up in my head. Since I, if I have to concentrate on breathing in and breathing out, that is trouble with breathing. <sighs> I called the uh, 911. They sent an ambulance to the house to get me. Uh, and I've got to tell you, it was not a fabulous ambulance. It was uh, one of those rickety old trucks and I was having to crawl up in it myself. Um, it, none of the, the special uh, uh, you know, stretchers that they have, it was just a truck. And I crawled up in it with the help of uh, the two people who were there, the paramedics. And they rolled me to the hospital, it was near as my home. And it bumped and rattled all along the way and I was sick and I was worried for me. We got there, they rolled me off, and that is when something remarkable happened. As we were going through the doors of the emergency room, I could see that the walls of the emergency room in the waiting area and everywhere else were lined with gurneys of people, people on the walls, just filled with sick people. And I didn't see how in the world anybody was gonna pay attention to me and all of that. But even though that truck was old, the driver, the paramedic was an experienced man. And he told the person who was his partner to just wait with me at the door. And he went in there and all I can tell you is that when he came out, I had a room. I was not on the walls. I, they actually put me in a room. That's what he did with his experience. He reported what was really going on. I waited in that emergency room for hours with people kind of coming in and coming out, taking this test, doing that sort of thing. I was freezing and chilling and going alternately fire with heat and chill the whole time. I did get an oxygen mask on, but pretty most part, that's all I got while that was waiting. Finally, a doctor comes in and tells me that I do probably have COVID, but he could, he could uh, make a case for me or against it to stay or not, what did I think he should do? And I looked at him and I told him, make the case. And he said, okay, that's what we'll do. And they admitted me. So I'm in this hospital now for, oh, maybe almost four days. Um, 
literally um, just just fighting COVID with very little that they knew how to do other than to try to keep my vitals going. There was um, no real medication for it. There was just what they could do to uh, take um, care of symptoms that were getting too crazy. And in all that time, there was no real attention to my ability to do basic things. For instance, going to the bathroom, I was pretty much on my own if I could make it there. And I wasn't eating and nobody seemed to notice that except for the young woman who brings your meal from the kitchen in that plastic bag. After several back and forth trips, she noticed I wasn't eating. She said, "Miss Finley, you're not eating, you gotta eat something. And I said, I don't, I don't see how I could eat. If you ever wondered what it would be like not to have an appetite, not to choose not to eat, but not to have your body kind of figure out how eating would go. Um, that's the state I was in. Fortunately, she thought it was serious enough to report to the nurses. One came in and said, uh, essentially, you're not eating. And um, I said, yeah. And I, I thought to her, she said, you've got to eat something. And I thought, maybe I could drink and insure. Now, the reason I know about insurance is because I've just come off the year where my mother had dementia and they got to the point where she could not eat. And that's all we could do would be maybe now and then to get her to sip and insure. And they bought me an insure from the nurse's refrigerator in the back of the counter, you know, where the nurses might have their food. <laughs> and there was one and I was able to drink that and that is what I had for nourishment. So I'm going in and out of consciousness and fever just battling this thing uh, as best I could. And in one of the hazes of in and out, I see a little woman in a white coat in my room and she is looking at my charts and you know the machines that are beeping and everything. And I'm thinking she just might be the one. She might be the doctor that all the other doctors were waiting on. As it turns out, this hospital had one immunologist and she was it. And that meant that doctors who normally knew how to do everything about everything, anything, didn't know anything about what to do about this COVID thing. And so she literally ran the war room and everything that they did had to be approved by her. It was that kind of, of, of helplessness that they were experiencing as well. So I'm looking at her and I asked, are you the doctor? And she just nodded while she was looking at my stuff, my mask. And I asked, I, am I gonna be okay? Am I gonna get through this? And she looked at my stuff again and she simply nodded. And I said, am I almost through it? And she nodded again that I was almost, she fell through it. And then I said, are you the immunologist? And she said, I just had to come and see my patients. And so she was walking in the night over hundreds of rooms just to physically see patients like a normal doctor would and get out of that room where she would, everywhere she was holed up, where she would normally just see statistics and information. She was walking to see her patients and I was one of them. Jesus, um, we went uh, through all of that sickness and endurance when finally they told me they thought I could go home. And I knew that the day they told me I could go home, I could not go home yet. So I told them I'll, I need another day of support. And in that time, my sister called to tell me, whenever you go home, you can't go home by yourself. You'll need some help. So she advised me to call social services in the hospital to try to get a visiting nurse. And the first social services told me something that sounded like I couldn't have it. And my sister told me to call back and tell them and insist on it. And I'm sick, but I have to advocate for me. And I do. And then they arrange for a visiting nurse to be part of my recovery care. When I am finally discharged from the hospital, I'm still sick, very sick, very weak. I can barely sit up in the wheelchair and my son comes to get me. And this is where everything makes a difference. My son comes to get me. And we get home and he said, mom, here's what we're gonna do. You are going to stay here and quarantine here. We've got dad in my condo, we're quarantining there. 
and that Khalid, our other son, will take care of me. And I, he said, will take care of dad. And that's how we will do it. And that is what they did. Literally, I laid in my bed. He set up a camera in my bedroom that's like their next a ring system so that they could see me, the family could see me because I couldn't talk to them. And they report that all they ever saw me was either laying in the bed, uh, just you know, unconscious or, or maybe trying to get to a bathroom. I'll tell you one other thing about the family because this matters, I think, depending on what's going on and what support you have. Uh, I used to worry because I'd had sons and I loved them dearly and they loved me, but they weren't daughters. And I know what we had done for my mom at her end of days. And I thought these might be mine. And I worried for myself and care. But my sons took care of us as though we were babies. They lifted us, they cleaned us, they changed us, they fed us. They did everything with as much gentle attention and care when I think about it is when I took care of them when they were babies. And that's what I did not know that I had in my sons. Time passed, Eddie and I were reunited about a month later, he came home here and I was able to deal and do uh, a little bit and we continued to recover together. Now COVID tried literally to kill us in every which way it could, but for the intervention of the hospital and the medical services trying to figure out what to do about what they did not know what to do. And even then their resistance uh, to uh, the idea that they needed to care for us as soon as possible instead of waiting for us to get a little sick. All of those were parts of the things that were broken in our healthcare system anyway. And um, it showed up. Since then, I just wanna let you know we are better. And uh, we, we're now, we were on the hunt for the COVID vaccine shot. I'm sure all of you have been through it. It's the one where you hear about a COVID shot that might be available and you sign up online and nothing happens and you call or somebody knows somebody who knows somebody and you're out there like a drug addict trying to score a shot in the virtual world. It's a desperate situation. I got a a note that said that I had won some sort of lottery at a hospital that I had been to um, intermittently sometime in the past. And therefore I could come there and get my first shot of And I did, and I didn't want to because I wanted for Eddie to get one too. But they told me he, since he wasn't their patient, they wouldn't give me anybody with the shot but me. We talked about it and he told me, baby, go get when you're shot, get whatever you have to do and see what you can do about saving yourself. And so I went and I got the shot. He drove me there and he waited for me to be picked up down in the car and all that. The next opportunity for him to get the shot was, oh, well, maybe almost a month later, felt like, if not quite that time, a month, maybe a less time than that. One of those online uh, sign up things actually worked and told him to come on down. And this is when it got interesting too. So we both are going into the clinic where he is to get the shot, another product different from the one I got. And at the clinic, they tried to separate us. <laughs> I am there and he is there and we are there together because it usually takes the two of us, you know, to do you, it's the person who needs the services and you show up with loved one or dear one. And they tried to separate us and they tried to separate the couple in front of us too, the older couple. And that woman said she wasn't leaving her man and when they got to me, I said, oh, I'm with her. I'm not leaving my man. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> the idea that you're going to go do something in the back with him. And I don't get to see and understand what it is and how he's doing. I'm holding a lot of the information. So this whole business of separating the Black family just to deliver a, a, a shot, is they're not prepared for us um, culturally or socially. Eddie went on back there uh, and I told a nurse, uh, no, the security person, listen, he's going back there without his coat because he's got a fever and you know he's still hot, maybe a little bit. Uh, we don't know if it's a fever, if he's just hot, we don't know. But don't let him come out in the parking lot without letting me know to bring his coat. And she, I said, he cannot come out in the cold without his coat. Have I been clear? I said to this young woman with a badge on, and she said, yes, ma'am. And don't you know, he came on out 
Fortunately, I came in early and there he walked past the lady with the badge and he didn't see me and he was about to go into that parking lot. And I like to body tackle them, you know, just to be sure that he would be um, warm enough and to, to get back in the car with these low degrees. I'm trying to tell you, we were trying to take care of each other, even in spite of a system that saw us as nameless, faceless individuals instead of the family that we actually are. We now have our first COVID shots. We did have side effects, um, nothing compared to COVID. We had fever and we had chills and some aches, but all of that stuff we managed with Tylenol for real in a day uh, or two. Eddie was sicker a little bit longer than I was, but we did manage it. And now we are looking forward to getting our second shots and we know some more about how to navigate the system and the system knows more about the Finleys, which means they won't be trying to separate us if they intend to be intact. Thank so, you, Ms. So Finley. Thank you, Ms. So, Finley. I, I sorry, so, so sorry to cut you off. It's a riveting story. And again, we are so thankful that uh, both you and Eddie are recovering, that you've been able to get your vaccine and, you know, and that you are that example for the community. It's a powerful story and we really appreciate you showing it. Um, now we are going to turn to Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, who is the Deputy Director at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Hooper is going to share with us the science in reducing the COVID-19 impact among African Americans. And this is such a vitally important presentation. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Hooper. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and special thanks to the Allergy and Asthma Network for hosting this important event, it's been very interesting. And I'm pleased to have this opportunity, especially alongside you know, such esteemed co-panelists. And I'm here to add what I can to the discussion of these important topics with a focus on what NIH is doing and also some work that my own team has done. This is just a quick disclaimer um, that I'm not necessarily representing the government with some of my comments. Okay, so moving along to the next slide, please. We have uh, reviewed earlier the startling statistics about COVID-19 cases and mortality. And this slide is about patients uh, based on the science who we know are at higher risk of severe outcomes due to their pre-existing medical status. So studies thus far point to more deteriorating outcomes among patients with medical comorbidities, which means more than you know, one condition, compared to patients without them. So COVID-19 patients with a history of a number of chronic illnesses, including chronic lung disease, cancer and others have the worst prognosis and most often end up with complicating outcomes such as pneumonia compared to others. And these patients are not only at risk for contracting the virus, but there's a significantly increased risk of death. We also know that individuals um, 65 years and older account for about 80% of COVID-19 mortality. Now, this slide is about vaccine hesitancy, which is a very complex cognitive and behavioral construct and it varies for specific vaccines, place, and time, it represents really the midpoint of a continuum that ranges from complete refusal to full vaccine acceptance. And it's influenced by several factors, such as we call them the three Cs. They are complacency, convenience, and confidence. And the biggest concern is that without intervention, hesitancy may shift to complete refusal. So for scientists at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, Efforts to recognize, understand, and address the population-specific reasons for COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy are really important. Um, and we know that the common reasons are about the speed of development, potential harm from the, from the ingredients, the yet unknown longer-term health effects, and unanswered questions about whether these vaccines prevent infection and transmission. Next slide, please. So survey findings uh, reported in December from US respondents revealed that there are racial ethnic differences among those who indicated that they would definitely or probably accept a COVID-19 vaccine with 42% of African-American respondents reporting probable acceptance, followed by about 61% of white respondents, 63% of Hispanic Latino and 83% of Asian American respondents. And these data actually do reflect an improvement relative to numbers from December. These were numbers from November, and the percentages are much lower than what we need to see, um, even among white and Latino populations. And it shows that we have work to do. 
um, and even among individuals who are regularly vaccinated against the flu. African Americans are more than twice as likely to report that they would not seek the COVID-19 vaccine. And we hope to see some improvement in this as people become more comfortable over time and have you know, their major questions answered. Next slide. So you may have seen this report. I found this really striking. These are data from an initial analysis of the 17 states and two cities that released vaccination levels by racial ethnic population. So this was as of January 25th. And here what you see is dispersion. So you want these dots to be going together and along the lines of more vaccination, higher percentages. But this shows that as of late January, the rate of vaccinations among African-Americans in these locations are lower than they should be. And as an example, in North Carolina, which is four or five lines down, African-Americans account for 22% of the population and 26% of the healthcare workforce, but only 11% of vaccine recipients. Now let's compare that. Let's go to the next slide and compare this to white adults, where you can see here, those lines are on the other end, on that right side of the figure, which means more vaccination. And those numbers are, those lines are tracking together, especially the, the purple ones. Um, and it shows that white adults are getting vaccinated at closer to or higher than expected levels in most of the states that have been examined thus far. So I think an important point is that this is not all due to vaccine hesitancy on the part of African Americans. There are structural factors such as access, the digital divide, and competition for appointments as also contributing factors. And there are probably other reasons driving this as well, such as maybe misinformation, which we know is everywhere. And it's early in the process of vaccine distribution still. So again, we have work to do and we are monitoring these data. Next slide. So next, I want to tell you a little about the NIH Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities, what we call our STEAL initiative, which is working on this from a national perspective. That is debunking misinformation and disseminating accurate messages, particularly in disproportionately affected populations. Next slide. So the um, overarching goal of STEAL is to understand factors that contribute to this disproportionate burden in our underserved communities. And we are working with community partners across sectors to address misinformation, to engage trusted voices, to facilitate enrollment in clinical trials, and to invest within the communities, which is important not only for COVID-19 disparities, but for health disparities that are longstanding. Next slide, please. So the SEAL Alliance currently includes 11 states, those highlighted in blue, who were funded back in the summer in the areas of the country that of the country at that time that had the surging cases and a disproportionate burden among racial ethnic minority communities. And we expect shortly to bring on other states into the alliance. And the alliance is really about the ground game. And this is these are just a few of many examples of the activities happening in partnership with local communities. So these teams are conducting variety of activities, such as fostering clinical trial inclusion, conducting needs assessment in the communities, and building awareness about how to stay healthy while providing personal protective equipment, hand sanitizer, and other needed resources into the community. Next slide, please. So these are just a few metrics of the early reach of SEAL. Reach is how many people are we actually touching? So in about five months, our reach has been very strong. There are a range of activities being conducted, and you can see the list here, things like text messaging campaigns, distributing materials, hosting webinars and town halls, and having local community meetings, and SEAL has reached over 3 million people with accurate educational messages. Next slide. So the other thing I wanted to mention was that, you know, these issues around trust and distrust in underserved communities that we hear so much about, we know that this really precedes COVID, especially among African-Americans. It just may be highlighted now and brought to the forefront more. And it, since 2017, I had the honor of working with a really dedicated and amazing community advisory board who you know, has known for a long time that this is what we needed to be focusing on, understanding and addressing community trust and distrust for healthcare um, in our local underserved community. So we formulated a study on this and we published the first set of results in 2019 and we didn't know at the time how much more relevant this work would be today. Um, this was a listening tour that we conducted among 130 adults at nine community-based sites in Northeast Ohio. Next slide, please. And I'll just show you a few of the themes that emerged during the study. This is the infographic that we made sure to disseminate 
and return the results back into the community. But what we found um, were that compared to, uh, to compared to white participants, African American adults exhibited greater distrust, reported greater perceptions of healthcare as being more about big business and making money versus concern about patients' well-being. Um, there were also greater financial hardships discussed, perceived disparities in the quality of the care, per, uh, poor patient clinician communication, and also an overall skepticism about biomedical research. But this is not all about, you know, there are justifiable reasons why and, and direct experiences that have led to this distrust. It's not like people are just wanting to be distrusting for no reason. It's well justified, and we know that that's true. Next slide. So I don't have time to go into full details, but I, I welcome you to read the published article, and I can share the, that the reasons were, again, more than individual beliefs and attitudes. It was direct interpersonal medical provider and healthcare system problems and injustices. And this quote was one that really stayed with me. Our participants stated when asked what healthcare systems, doctors, and researchers could do to gain trust, they said, we don't care how much you know until we know how much you care. And that always has stayed with me. Next slide, please. And once we listened, we wanted to do more to help. Um, so our findings really signal you can go to the next slide, that um, what was going to be helpful maybe is a sort of community responsive approach focusing on these topics and finding a way to provide lay-oriented education, address misinformation, and begin to remediate distress. So this is different than sending educational messages alone and in a passive way. What we did was um, brought what we call a user-generated intervention out into the community. We saw that there were so many questions that needed answered and clarifications were needed about how physicians operate, what support services are available within hospitals, and many other concerns. So we decided to bring with us this time people who actually had the answers to these questions. Next slide. So we actually involved nine clinicians and clinical researchers and also seven support services professionals. They volunteered their time to join us in the community and engage directly with our community members. And we told our participants, hey, listen, this is a rare opportunity to talk directly with health educators or social workers in your own safe spaces and ask and researchers and ask them your questions. Ask them anything you want to know. That's how they generated the own intervention versus us telling them what they needed to know. So this was their opportunity to ask anything they ever wanted to know about how healthcare systems work, doctors, researchers. And the table here lists some of the really great questions um, that were asked. Next slide. So of course we conducted as scientists an evaluation of the program and these are just some of the findings. I think the main takeaway is that participants found this experience to be beneficial as it related to addressing trust and distrust. If you focus on the columns with the red numbers, you can see that about 90% of participants reported that they, that they agreed that they had the opportunity to ask questions of interest to them they also really strongly agreed that the professionals they talked to were very trustworthy. So this was excellent. The, the clinicians and the clinical researchers who came out and met with our community members attended to their concerns. They addressed myths, they used understandable language, and I would say they sort of kept it real when, when certain questions were asked and they showed empathy. And the bottom three rows here show that over half the sample said that as a result of the study that they trust healthcare systems and researchers more and that they would consider joining a trial. Now these ratings, while they were strong at the bottom, they actually showed that you know, it was easier for them to trust the people who work within the system compared to the systems as a whole. Those numbers were a little lower, like in the 40, um, the 50, 60% compared to 80, 90%. So I think that institutional and biomedical research trust and distrust, it's very complex, not easily gonna be modified in one dialogue, However, this study showed that this sort of promising approach to working through distrust by taking the time to demonstrate trustworthiness, P, trustworthiness with underserved members of a community. I think step three with the, of this work would need to focus on kind of multi-level approaches that incorporate the upstream determinant, things like healthcare system factors to improve trustworthiness, to help us achieve diversity in biomedical research and to really turn that dial towards health equity. Finally, I invite you to check out this interview that I conducted with my parents-in-law in late in December of last year, and we released it about a week ago. They are participants in a COVID-19 vaccine trial, and the conversation
African Americans. And um, the link is really long, so if you were to Google it um, with those words, family COVID interview with my name, Monica Hooper, you would, you would, it would come up. And um, perhaps it can be helpful to you or to um, your loved one. So I thank you very much for this opportunity to, to share. Thanks. Dr. Hooper, this was fantastic. I wish that we had a full hour just to hear more about the wonderful work that you are leading at the NIH. And, and we welcome you to come back and join us again for a future session. And, and certainly we will make this link available and share it with all the participants today. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. So as we continue, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Graham. He's going to wrap up with a few slides and I think we have one more poll. Dr. Graham? Trust in your thing is a, a very important idea. The fact that our presidents, our past three presidents have taken a stand to do this, I think tells us a lot. Also, those of you out there who, who maybe have taken the vaccine or inclined to do so, you also can be very important role models to your peers. People tend to take advice more from peers than anyone else. So I wanna thank, uh, I thank all of the people on this program. Um, I'll give you my own experience. I have a higher risk due to being 60, in a minute, 67 years old. I have comorbid conditions. I have hypertension. It's albeit well controlled, but about 10 years ago, I had an aortic aneurysm and had to have my aortic valve replaced as well as a uh, build of my aorta. I'm in good, good shape. I exercise, but I'm exactly the kind of person that doesn't need to get COVID and potentially could do very, very badly. Great, thank you, Dr. Graham, for sharing your own experience, Dr. Parikh's experience, the examples of our former presidents as well. So let's go to our final poll question before we turn to your questions for a few moments this evening. So the final poll says, after participating in today's event and hearing more about COVID-19 and, and the vaccines that we've heard, would this change your mind about getting the COVID vaccine? So you had already decided to get it. This information really just confirmed that decision. You changed your mind and now you actually think you may get the vaccine or you didn't change your mind. You're still not really sold on obtaining the vaccine at this time. Again, we just want your honest feedback. We really appreciate so many of you staying with us even after the top of the hour. And so if you'll log in your response, we'll go ahead and share uh, collectively what the response is to this uh, really wonderful participation this evening. Give it just another second and then I will end the poll and share the results. I see many more logging in now. Oops. So it looks like 72% of you say you've already decided you're definitely going to continue along that path of getting the vaccine. About 10% of you actually changed your mind as a result of this evening's conversation. I can't tell you, I've got the biggest smile on my face. This makes me so incredibly happy. This is why we're doing the work we're doing at Allergy and Asthma Network every day dedicated to COVID-19. And then there is still a significant portion, 18% of you who aren't quite sure you're still exploring and, and really not willing to get the vaccine at this time. And again, we stand with you. We respect your individual choice. We know that these are complex topics that aren't often as straightforward as they may seem, and that it does take building that trust and continuing to educate yourself and make the decision that's right for you and for your family. So thank you for being honest and for sharing. So at this time, we're going to go to some of the questions that have been posed by the group. Uh, we will stay on the line for about another 10 minutes uh, and, and field some of these questions to the panel, but we also are going to develop a FAQ because we have hundreds of questions that have come in our time together today and we just won't be able to get to all of them. But let's go ahead and take some of the most interesting and, and some of the most relevant. So first, does the vaccine only provide protection for a short period of time, like three months or six months? Dr. Parikh, why don't you address that for us? Right, you know, so that's a very popular and important question. Um, the short answer is we don't know yet, you know, because 
with everything in this pandemic, we're, we're learning as we go, you know? So um, as of now, there's good data that, you know, at least we have eight to nine months protection based on people who were vaccinated early on in the trials. Um, but again, we don't know how long that will last. Um, yesterday, the CDC actually said that, you know, if you've had the vaccine, and you're exposed both doses and you're two weeks out and you're exposed to someone who uh, has COVID-19, then you, you actually don't have to quarantine as long as it was within 90 days. So we know at least 90 days um, is, is kind of the magic number, but we'll learn more as that goes and that will evolve. Um, again, if, if you're having symptoms, please quarantine, you know, but this is for the asymptomatic people who've been vaccinated with both doses and are two weeks post that mark. Very helpful. Now, here's an interesting question. What if I don't get side effects after the vaccine? Does it mean that it maybe didn't work? Um, I, I can take that one as well. So no, actually, not everybody gets side effects. Um, similar to the flu vaccine and other vaccines, some people, um, their immune system uh, really reacts very strongly, but and some people feel nothing. Uh, for example, with the flu shot, I get zero symptoms, whereas some of my patients and family members do feel symptomatic. So that doesn't mean it's not working. But again, if you do feel symptoms, that's also um, normal as well, either way. Yeah. Now, this is a really important question, Dr. Graham, I'm gonna ask you to address it. How long do you think it will be until the vaccination is actually available to people with underlying medical conditions and not just those like frontline healthcare workers or those in the high risk, highest risk groups of, of over 65? What about individuals like those that may be on the line with asthma or, C, or uh, COPD? Because we have seen some states that have actually delayed access to those individuals. Do you have any ideas on yeah, when ideas we might be had, moving? Yeah, the ideas that I had are based on just anecdotal reports and stuff, but it would seem that that should be the next group that should grow, that should uh, open up. Um, it's also a little bit disconcerting because there is a lot of, and Dr. Parikh might want to comment, there's a lot of variability once we get through uh, A and B among states. So it's hard to say, but what I, I'll give somebody a very good suggestion. The way my wife and I got our vaccines, the, the health department down here was swamped, the computer lines crashed. We went to the new primary care provider we had and that person advocated for us. And I don't know that enough people are doing that. That's a relationship that you've built over time and that's what worked. And when I got my second shot yesterday, I ran into people that that's exactly how they got it. So I think that's a very important tool and also having conversations with your primary care or specialty care about your unique risk pattern as it applies to that, I think is important as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Graham. And again, we'll keep you posted and we do have links on our website where you can go state by state and see exactly what phase your community is in and where you can begin to access uh, the vaccine in your own community. Now, this next question is gonna go to Dr. Hooper. Um, it's from a patient on the line who says, seeing the story of Dr. Moore die due to health and racial inequities and seeing patients have more anaphylactic reactions uh, with even without death, but seeing that black woman die after the vaccine and are in the midst of COVID is very scary and reminiscent of Henrietta or Tuskegee. Could you comment on that? Because it sounds like it is that fundamental issue around trust that you were expl explaining earlier. Yes, I mean that story um, was really heartbreaking, and I'm even I'm not even an avid tweeter, but I, I tweeted about Dr. Moore. I think that many of us have known someone like her, and I think we were all just um, not really overwhelmingly surprised, but just disappointed yet again that here you have a woman who is educated, who is herself a physician, and from her bed can chronicle what she perceived and, and probably accurately so to be mistreatment at the hospital. I mean, we know that there are biases, there are implicit biases, and there's just outright explicit discrimination happening. Um, many of us have experienced it directly in healthcare settings, or we know people who have. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's one of the reasons that the distrust is, is where it can be at times. And certainly in the, in the individuals who I've worked with, my own personal experiences and those of my family, I've seen it firsthand and heard it enough in enough se se uh, settings to know that it's true. Um, so I always recommend that, you know, that patients go into the doctor's office, they, uh, they, uh, as much as they can conduct their own research only from reputable sites like the CDC, for instance, or an NIH based site, and to the extent possible, bring someone with you if you have someone who is in your family, 
um, who is in the medical profession, that can make a really big difference. Hospitals also often have, and in certain health clinics, community health workers or people who are there as patient advocates. And um, so that might be another way to help, um, but, it, but I, I get it. Um, and I, and I only could say that I'm saddened by what happened to her um, and it's happened too often. And the work that we're doing is trying to encourage um, people to learn more about their own biases, to be able to acknowledge them because you know our lives matter. And that was another example where it seemed like the life just didn't matter as much. Absolutely, thank you for that. And we share that. It was a most unfortunate um, you know, story that, and, and convergence of events. Now, Dr. Preet, this question seems most appropriate for you. And it, and it says specifically, so I've had COVID and I believe that I have antibodies. Do I still need to get the vaccine? Um, yes, you do, because what we've seen is um, that the vaccine actually produces a more robust um, immune response than getting sick naturally with COVID-19. Um, also, we think that the immunity from the vaccine may, be, may last longer from what we know thus far. So we absolutely would encourage it. We've been seeing cases of reinfection uh, from COVID-19. We've also been seeing that people are even sicker the second time around. So for all those reasons, uh, absolutely. I, I personally just anecdotally have patients that did have antibodies in June who had recovered from COVID-19 and they no longer do. So again, the immunity picture is not clear. So we definitely would encourage um, you to get the vaccine. And so if you have had COVID, how long should you wait post COVID to get the vaccine? That's a follow up there. Right. That's a great question. So uh, in the studies, um, we had people wait 90 days but the current CDC guidelines is that once you are feeling back to normal, so once you're past the sickness, um, you can get the vaccine. The only catch is if you were one of those who received uh, monoclonal antibody treatment when you got sick, either the Regeneron antibodies or Lilly, then you still should wait those 90 days because there may be interaction with the vaccine. But otherwise, if you didn't receive that treatment, um, you can go ahead and be vaccinated when you're feeling back to your uh, normal self. All right, we're going to take just one final question. And actually, I'll open it up to all the panelists. Um, for the African American community specifically, is there any data that suggests one vaccine is better than another for people of color? If Dr. Hooper, you are actually muted, I think. You're muted. Yeah. I'm muted. Okay. okay. I, I, the short answer there is no. Um, for the Pfizer and Moderna child, um, they did analyze the results by race and ethnicity, and there were no differences. And frankly, there, sh there should be no reason that there are. Race is a social construct. It is not a biological construct. Human bodies are human bodies. They all work the same way. So the answer there is no. I'm going to tweet yeah, that, I'm Dr. Great. Hooper. That was a wonderful statement. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to retweet that for from you tonight. Thank you so Thank much you. for that, and we agree, Dr. Parikh. Any final comment that you'd like to make there? No, I I couldn't agree more. You know, un unfortunately, it's not has nothing to do with uh, genetic makeup. You know, we're we're all the same. So uh, I would take whichever vaccine's given uh, first. You know, regard because we're losing far too many lives on a daily basis. Absolutely. All right, we'll go to Dr. Graham as well. Any final words, Dr. Graham? Yeah, just have people be diligent. And, you know, you get frustrated early with the trial of the vaccine and so forth. Uh, just be persistent. Uh, there's many ways to do it. Look locally, the different ways people are accessing it. And sometimes uh, people find the ways in. Don't give up, is what I can say. Don't give up. Absolutely. Don't give up. And we are going to be right here along with you. We are halfway through our sessions for the Black people like me. So we'll be continuing to engage you through the next at least three to six months and supporting you in this journey. We have also developed several education resources that are tailored specifically to the Black community. So visit our trustedmessengers.org website or the Allergy Asthma Network COVID-19 Information Center, where you can get access to these evidence-based uh, resources and materials, just like Dr. Hooper was saying. We take everything directly from those trusted sources and from the experts like you've heard tonight. And these are very helpful documents. We're also going to be coming to a community 
just like yours and partnering with the churches, partnering with the physicians and with local social influencers to host events and to accelerate vaccination within the community. As you all know, we have developed an online place just for you. So on Facebook, we have a closed group called Black People Like Me and our success will come from each of you engaging and participating in that private Facebook group. So join that online community and participate uh, in becoming Becoming one of the trusted resources. We also have opportunities to participate in other activities like telehealth and digital health free of charge, where we've got ongoing support for individuals that are uh, recovering from COVID and or living with asthma and or COPD. You'll also remember that we still have our inspirational imagery and quotes, and these are a few of the new things that have been developed by our advisory group and by you as the community. And I love these. Again, an injustice for one and is, is an injustice for all. Anissa Prescott uh, provided this, and I think it's such an inspiration. And, and really, the quote comes from Dr. Parika, and it's, it's one that I love, and I think stands at the heart of everything that we're doing in this particular program. And then the image above of Leonis Quinn and, and her son who unfortunately passed from asthma. And Leonis shares a quote here by Maya Angelo: if you find it in your heart to care for somebody else, you will have succeeded. And that truly is what Black People Like Me is all about. It truly is the heart of Allergy and Asthma Network and why we continue to exist daily to support you as a national nonprofit. We request that you stay engaged, stay creative, social, continue to post drawings, photos, share your story. Uh, we want to celebrate this progress that in the journey that we're on together over the coming months. Once again, thank you all for joining today. Uh, please complete the program evaluation and the post test and mark your calendars for our next conference, which will be on March 11th uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern. You have an opportunity to join several different programs and registries, as I mentioned before, and please don't forget engaging on that Facebook page. Look for the frequently asked questions and the addition of the questions from this evening, as well as the PowerPoint and the playback recording of tonight's session. Again, I just wanna thank the panel and thank each of you. Have a blessed day.